All right. So yeah, so tonight we're just going to be doing this in kind of three sections, if you will. Uh, the first is going to be introductions, then we're going to go into kind of what your rights are. Uh, after that, we're going to have a quick break for people that want to break, and we're also going to go into breakout rooms where at that point people can talk amongst themselves about uh, issues they've had as tenants and what they've done to kind of rectify that. Um, then we're going to go and do a section on what how to actually exercise your rights. We'll do another short break, and then we're going to hear uh, two talks from two people that have helped organize tenant associations and what that looked like from them. So first for the introduction, we're just gonna do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, this workshop is open to everyone, it's online. Um, any, so you know, a lot of people might not necessarily be represented by this, but Ofco as an organization works um, specifically where this is relevant. So I'm just gonna say this, because I think for a lot of people here too, it will be relevant as well. But uh, we, myself specifically too, are on the lands of the Haudenosaunee the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We are under the authority of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, which is a treaty that banned the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee, pardon me, to share and protect the land. Europeans and newcomers were invited to live under this treaty, but the colonizers had other ideas. The clearing of the land for settlement saw the ongoing genocide of indigenous peoples from the Indian agents to the past system, for, for, excuse me, from residential schools to the underhoused and incarcerated. We, the newcomers, did not honor the dishes one spoon, where other nations honored their relationship with the land. We saw land as property, as resource, as something to be extracted. And as tenants, we know how harmful this extraction can be. We're here tonight because we believe in a form of community, of sharing, of peace that's stronger than any colonial state. So Ofco, as an organization, um, as I mentioned, is situated on these lands. We're uh, a local nonprofit. We're completely resident run um, from residents in the community that we represent. For people that are interested in the work we do, there's two main actions. You can see links here if anyone's following along in the slides. Uh, so the first thing we do are community working groups. And those are on a number of different topics, such as um, how seniors fare in our community, for example, the green space we have, health and safety in our community, um, youth in our community. So the point of this is that in general, tenants and many members of the community um, in the city are chronically underrepresented at council meetings and in terms of actual policy that is implemented by the city that affects us. So the aim of these is to create informed policy that we can then share with city council and say objectively, this is what people in our community want, this is why they want it, and try and shape policy for our community, um, among a number of other things that frankly, I don't even have Sorry, I'm getting caught up on myself, but among a number of other things that like Avco does with the working groups that really do help with our community in general. Um, the other thing is the tenant solidarity program, which this actually falls under. So the tenant solidarity program is um, fundamentally our goal is to empower tenants. One of the ways we do that is workshops like this, um, where we try and inform and educate about what people's rights uh, as tenants are and also ways to see those rights to fruition because the legal system as we're going to learn in this workshop if you don't already is not necessarily always on our side as tenants. Um, we do a number of other things. If you are in the Ofco community and you would like to start a tenants association after this workshop, we can even help you by um, creating and distributing resources such as leaflets for you, um, helping you organize a tenant association. It is literally my job to do this and I'm very happy to help. Um, so we're also doing other things like a tenant solidarity network, um, which is supposed to be a, a community-wide tenant union, but there's a lot of good things that we're doing, and um, yeah, this is one of those things that it falls under. Uh, as I mentioned, Ofco is representing the Oakwood Vaughn community. Uh, this is the Oakwood Vaughn community, and if you are in this community, uh, we can actually, as I mentioned, help you directly and provide resources and one-on-one -on -one help and advice, any number of things. If you do want to get in touch, uh, listed here is the Ofco website. We also have, uh, I'm the tenant organizer. My email is here. So uh, that's my personal email. And the email below that is the Oakwood Vaughn um, tenant organizer email. You can access me through either. If you want to access, uh, pardon me, contact Ofco for uh, anything else, the Ofco email is just below that. So this is in the slide deck that I shared in the, uh, in the chat. If anyone wants to access this, you can find this there. 
just a quick statement on inclusion too, something that's very important is that we are a community led organization. Consequently, we really strive to represent our community and with open arms. We host these workshops really because this is about organizing in our community and making it safer. Um, and one of the ways we do that is just by being an open organization. We want this to start with us. We want to be supportive of everyone, regardless of class, creed, race, religion, or sexual slash gender identity. Um, so yeah, this Ofco is a safe space is really what I'm just trying to say with this statement. So yeah, without any further ado, that was the introduction. We're just gonna go over basically here what your actual rights are as tenants um, as they are set out in law. So we'll get to that in a second, but before we actually go over any of the issues that might arise and what your rights are in those cases, we're gonna talk about, uh, very boring I know, but the legal system itself. So in Ontario, tenant law, is regulated by the Residential Tenancies Act. This is known uh, shorthand as the RTA. And one thing I would really stress about the RTA is that it's not really necessarily about making sure you as a tenant are safe and protected. More so it's about regulating the relationship between a landlord and a tenant. And it does this in a very legal way. Uh, and the point I would really try and drive home here is that the RTA was not written by tenants. Um, there's a lot of things that are very clearly theoretical in nature that don't necessarily actually apply. There's a lot of cases that aren't exactly covered in the RTA um, and tenants can slip through the, the cracks in those case, uh, places. So do understand that the, the law can protect us in some cases, but primarily it's written to kind of govern how a tenant and a landlord would um, would react to a conflict where, where to arise or an issue. It does not ensure we have heat necessarily. It tells us what to do when we don't have heat, which is often starting, unfortunately, starting a legal battle with a landlord. Um, the RTA does not apply in the following cases. If you're a boarder, which means you share, uh, excuse me, which means you share a common space or a living space with your landlord or a close relative of theirs, um, nor does it apply to people living in prisons, shelters, hospitals, university residents, and some long-term care uh, facilities. So first things first, we're gonna talk about uh, repairs and maintenance. Um, this is one of the most common things. If you want, feel free to kind of like raise your hand in the, um, on, on Zoom if you've had any of these issues. I know myself personally, I guess you can't really see my hand because I've got the, I've got the green screen going, but, um, I myself personally have had a lot of issues with repairs and maintenance um, as a tenant before and presently for that matter. And so let's just go over what you're entitled to. Um, anything that came with the unit you're renting, if it breaks, you're entitled to it to be repaired, generally speaking. So anything electrical, appliances that came with your units, um, things like the carpet, these are like the landlord is responsible to fix these if they break and they're responsible to fix them in a timely fashion. A timely fashion is a bit of, su of a subjective thing. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll talk about what to do to determine what is and isn't a timely fashion in the next section. But for now, um, it does know, it do know, pardon me, it does vary depending on what the issue is. If you have no heat, for example, that requires a much more prompt response than if you have a dirty, or pardon me, a carpet that needs replacing. Uh, landlords obviously, pardon me, maybe some say obviously, but in a lot of cases, landlords aren't responsible if you yourself break something, um, but they are responsible for normal wear and tear. Um, that's just, that's gonna be covered for you. Um, rent is a very common thing in our community that is being raised illegally. <laughs> Um, I'm lucky to have never experienced this personally, but I know it's very common in our community with lots of buildings, lots of tenants being subjected to above guideline rent increases. So in Ontario, there are annual increases on rent that are permitted. Um, the only exception for this, and this is an important exception, if you live in a unit built after 2018, there are exemptions for, for rent control. If you live in a unit that was completed before 2018, then your landlord this year cannot raise your rent above 1.2%. To, to actually raise your rent, they need to give 90 days notice written with the proper forms from the landlord tenant board. And on top of that, um, 
if there is going to be an actual, like, um, if there is going to be an above guideline rent increase, you'll also need um, proper forms in the landlord tenant board because there are some exceptions, such as if the landlord made massive renovations, if they, if you live in an apartment building and a landlord added uh, balconies, for example, that might be a case where you're permitted to have an above guideline rent increase, but you would need the proper forms from the landlord. If you do have an above guideline rent increase, there will be two ways to fight it, and you would have to fight it within one year of the rent increase, otherwise it just becomes permanent, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, heat is another thing, and this is a very important one, especially this time of the year. I myself have not had my units properly heated, my rooms properly heated before. So in Ontario, there are laws that require you heat a unit, uh, a living dwelling. And these are all legal terms that don't sound very real, but this is the terminology that's used in the RTA. Um, to minimums for certain times of the year, you'll need to look up what those minimums are because it does change municipally. If you live in Hamilton or Waterloo, for example, uh, that will be different than if you live in Toronto. The guidelines for Toronto, however, which presumably most people here are from, um, is that you can, landlords are required to ensure unit, um, tenants, pardon me, can heat their units to 21 degrees Celsius between uh, September 15 and June 1st. Something that's very important to mention here is that heat is a vital service, like, like water, like electricity and gas, it cannot be turned off for any reason whatsoever by the landlord. That can never happen and if it does happen or if your apartment is colder than 21 degrees celsius and you can't have it you know you, you have no way of increasing the heat that's not a voluntary choice you made what you should be doing is reporting this to the municipal licensing standards um, which is 311 it's the phone number 311 um, if you if this does happen to you i'd recommend using the terminology specifically vital services violation because that's just much more it's much more credible in a sense. It really draws to attention the issue for the people on the other end of the phone. Um, I'll also say landlord harassment is something that's happened to me. Um, and on this note, you're, it's just one of the most horrible things that's ever happened, that, that happens frequently is what I'm trying to say. So your landlord, just to be entirely clear, is not allowed to harass you, threaten you, or invade your privacy. Your landlord must also make sure no one is working for them or acting on their behalf does any of these things. That means a superintendent, um, a property manager cannot be harassing you either. Um, there's been cases like this of, uh, in our community where superintendents were openly and actively racist, which is a horrible case. Thankfully, the tenants in that building organized and got them removed. But that was, an, that was frankly illegal and unethical, obviously. Um, in some cases, your landlord is even responsible for ensuring other tenants don't harass you. So a common case like this is that if another tenant is being horrible to you and, and harassing you, frankly, um, it might actually be the landlord's obligation to intervene and take some form of action. This is very murky and depends on the context very much. If this is something you think is happening, it would probably be a good idea to seek out legal advice of some form. Um, and again, we'll be getting to that in the next section as to what that might look like. Um, there's a lot of different things about uh, that harassment can look like. A few things, aside from the obvious ones, such as yelling or insulting you, you cannot be discriminated against by your landlord for any reason. Um, this is saying or doing things that, is, that are discriminatory, for example, because of your race, religion, sexual orientation, uh, anything of that nature. You can't have services of any kind cut off because um because well because of anything you did that's if your landlord is getting to the point where they feel they want to cut off services because they don't like you as a tenant if they have grounds they would have to evict you but there's no le there's no legal basis for them to do any of these things it would be harassment um, another very important thing for this workshop especially is that you cannot prevent a, a landlord pardon me cannot prevent you from joining a tenant association nor can they harass you for trying to join or start a tenant association. Again, pests are really common. Has anyone here dealt with these? Um, suppose many people have, it's very common in our community. Um, they, they're a menace and they come from, 
from your neighbors sometimes and your neighbors get it from that piece of furniture they found on the curb because that's how it spreads because we're tenants, we're poor, we need free furniture. Everything in this room, you can't see it. Everything in this room I got for free at the curb. It's just, it's just part of being a tenant, I suppose. But when it does happen, it is absolutely, regardless of what your landlord might say, it's your landlord's responsibility uh, to deal with them. So once you inform your landlord that there are pests at the property, here's the, on the screen here is the actual steps that they need to take. The landlord, it's the landlord's responsibility to eliminate pests as well as prevent their spread. They need to do inspections of the common areas once they find out about pests, um, as well as monthly afterwards to ensure they don't re return. And they need to hire an actual licensed professional um, to take care of the pests if it's required. Um, once that happens, they also need to post, man uh, management needs to post records of their pest control in public spaces in the building, just so tenants can be kept abreast of any changes that's happening. Um, and also a very important thing that is a law that gets broken a lot is that, you know, landlords need to stop renting any units that have pests to new tenants. One caveat to all this is that you must allow your landlord to treat your unit for pests. That's um, that's you need to let them inside, but the landlord will need to notify you about what time is and um, what's required um, to prepare the unit for treatment. Evictions are a, a very big deal um, for tenants, obviously. So I'm going to really stress a lot of the points here um, because this is really one of the more important ones in terms of community safety and what this looks like for actually being able to stay and live in your home and be safe in that regard. So the big point I'll stress is that no matter what, you cannot ever be evicted without your landlord getting an, an eviction order from the landlord tenant board. It doesn't matter what your landlord says. It doesn't matter if you aren't a Canadian citizen. It, do, it does not matter your landlord needs an eviction order from the landlord tenant board to evict you. And on that note, if you've been locked out uh, or your landlord is threatening to do that, you should be seeking legal help immediately. Um, again, we'll be talking about where to get legal help, but be informed that there are, you know, there are resources that you can access as a tenant, especially in cases like these, so you can know what your rights are and how to, how to actually exercise them. Uh, after you've been given notice, again, you don't need to move out. And after the notice period is up, your landlord will apply if they really want you evicted, they'll apply for a hearing at the landlord tenant board. And if this happens, the, the process is written out here, but the thing I would stress is that you should really be going to the hearing because it does function similar to a court, a little more informal, um, but you'll be given an opportunity to fight this. You'll be given an opportunity to make your case. There's a case in our community on Winona where a tenant was threatened with eviction for property damage to their unit. And they went and they fought it. Um, and frankly, they're not being evicted now. So it, just because you're, you've gotten an eviction order doesn't necessarily mean you will wind up being evicted. It is incredibly important to go to your hearing though because the hearing can happen without you, um, which is, so, and if that happens, you're basically, it's it's basically a foregone conclusion that you will get evicted. Um, a sheriff will show up at your door if you don't leave before then, and you'll be forcibly removed from your home, unfortunately. Um, so there are different notices. This is a really important thing. Um, if you are being evicted, these are generally here, listed here are generally the reasons why you can be evicted in the first place and the amount of time of notice you need to be given before you're actually evicted. So if you owe rent, for example, that's 14 days of notice before uh, the eviction order can go to the landlord tenant board and then you'll have more time after that. Um, and you can see some other cases here and you know everyone has access to these resources. So I'm not going to necessarily read everything verbatim, but one thing I will drive home is the, uh, the last row here. If your landlord wants to tear down the building or use it for something else to be given 120 days notice. So this is actually known as uh, rent eviction or dem eviction, depending on the context. Um, and we're going to be talking about this in just one second. It's a very big deal. Um, it's a, especially in our community. So this workshop for anyone that might not know is aimed primarily uh, at the Eglinton part of the Avco region, just because 
Um, we know there's a lot of people in that community in those buildings, for example, who are going to be unfortunately uh, rent evicted at some point. For example, there are two buildings right by Eglinton and Dufferin that already have um, applications in for redevelopment with the city. So not to cause alarm for anyone, but it is almost a, it, it's basically a foregone conclusion that sometime in the coming years, this will happen um, to people in our community. So I really wanna draw attention to this. The link at the bottom here will show you more information about eviction if you're interested or wanna learn more. Um, and it's a Clio is a really good resource, I'll, I'll say that. Um, uh, but we'll get back to them in a second because I really want to talk about rent evictions. Um, I was talking about what rent evictions look like before, why they happen. But to be more explicit, a rent eviction is when a landlord is trying to evict a tenant by claiming they're going to complete renovations or demolish the unit to convert it to something else. Um, a big and an important term here that's going to come up more is the term N13 which is the specific form that um, your landlord will need to apply to the landlord tenant board to give you to evict you for rent eviction. Um, if you receive this, landlords will also oftentimes ask you to sign an N11. Um, and an N11 is a form that's trying to ask you to end your tenancy. You should never do this without consulting someone first because this is a way that uh, landlords very often try and get landlords to, uh, sorry pardon me try and get tenants to sign something so that they can have something in writing that they made an agreement and then this can get landlords off the hook for compensation they would have otherwise owed you for people within the ofco bounds uh, ofco the tenant solidarity program does have a legal defense fund so depending on your situation we might be able to actually help out cover some or all of the legal costs um, in a case like this too, it's a really good opportunity to organize in your building because then you can, in some senses, pretty much have the legal costs for everyone covered in one fell swoop and it would be a fraction of the cost because you'd only have to do it one time for everyone instead of everyone doing it individually. Um, so that is an option if you are in our community and this is something you face in the future. One very important thing is that, and this changes municipally, um, but in Toronto, uh, for sure, you have a right to return to the place you were rent evicted from without any rent, in rent increase once the renovations are done. One caveat is that this is only for buildings with six or more dwellings is the terminology, so six or more units. Um, and if that's the case, then you'd have a right to return without a rent increase. The problem is, is that oftentimes this can take several months um, and if, if that happens, it's, you know, people set up roots uh, in new communities oftentimes get displaced. So it's something that's enshrined in law, but it's not always as effective. Uh, down at the bottom of the page here, I really want to draw attention to these, um, because if you are ever facing a rent eviction, I would highly recommend coming back here and checking out these links. The first one is a general uh, website, and then uh, the second link is actually linked to on this page, but it's just a PDF very clearly outlining what your rights are in case of a rent eviction, the process that might happen and how you can fight it. There's so much more to talk about rent evictions. I've tried to keep it brief. Um, I really wanna talk about the idea of a bad faith rent eviction because it happens all the time. Your landlord can't evict you just because they want someone else that will pay more rent for your unit. But what happens very commonly is that your landlord will say they're evicting you for a reason they can evict you, uh, evict you for. And commonly referred to, you know, they'll commonly say like a rent eviction. But if that happens, it's very common for landlords to turn around and then just rent out the, the empty room to someone else for a few extra, you know, a few hundred extra bucks a month and just pocket the money, right? If this happens, you can fight it. And in a lot of cases, you're entitled to up to a year rent for a bad faith rent eviction, as well as up to $50,000 in fines from the landlord or $250,000 if they're a corporate landlord. We'll be talking about this a lot more and I'm very excited to have some of the people in our chat talk about this uh, because we do have a guest speaker here. But one of the most effective ways to resist unfair rent evictions is to organize in your building. And by organize, we mean, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk about what's happening, try to organize the tenant association and be a united front. Uh, examples of where this has actually worked, and you can find these links again at renovictionsto.com. 
Uh, Dover Court tenants fought back, Parkdale tenants in Weston. These are all examples of pe people organizing the key of their homes. Uh, one I'll also draw attention to is the last example, which is uh, tenants at 2419 Keel Street have now twice successfully resisted uh, N13 attempts. Um, and we actually have a guest speaker from that tenant association who will be speaking later tonight. You are always allowed to participate in a tenants association. And this is something I really wanna strike home because a lot of the time there's a lot of misinformation about what that even means. Um, there's been a lot of cases in our community too of landlords claiming one thing or trying to not recognize tenant associations or saying that you can't be in a tenant association because of you're behind in rent or because you're an immigrant, but it's never true. It isn't true. Everyone is entitled to be part of a tenant association. You can try and organize one in your building um, it applies unilaterally. And this is also a very common reason why landlords will start to harass people. Um, and if this happens, it is especially illegal in cases of trying of tenants trying to organize tenant associations um, or participate in one. So just to really drive this home point, the, pardon me, drive this point home, uh, is that if you want to participate in a tenant association, you can do so. Um, the RTA applies, it doesn't apply only for specific li living situations, such as being in prison, such as living in a hotel, such as living in a long-term care facility, but it always applies regardless of your class, creed, background, anything of that nature. If, you've, if you're an immigrant, if you're a refugee, if you're a legal citizen or not, you can be part of a tenant association, you are entitled to the rights the RTA sets out. If you've been in prison, if you're a senior, if you're a student, it doesn't matter. Um, you're always entitled to be part of a tenant association and you're always entitled to the rights that the RTA sets out for you. Um, if you are facing harassment specifically for participating in a tenant association, the landlord's company or the landlord himself can face up to a $100,000 fine. And if individual people such as a superintendent uh, are harassing you for your participation, they can individually face a fine of up to $25,000. So that was the uh, first part of the workshop. Thanks so much for everyone's attendance. Um, we're gonna take like a 15 minute break. You know, if you want to participate in breakout groups, it would be really good just to, for people to share their experiences as tenants, um, talk about what they've done, uh, when they've had issues, how it worked, what they might do differently today. Really just have a conversation about what it's like for you as a tenant in our community. If you want, just take this opportunity for you know, a quick break because we're all working folks and we've all got things. Um, we're gonna talk about what it actually looks like to exercise your rights now. And so the first thing I'll say is that for a lot of the things we've outlined here, this is, you know, this presentation in and of itself is a, uh, is a resource you can use if you think you have an issue. But a lot of the times it's kind of unclear if you're legally covered, um, if you're actually entitled to something. So if you think you have an issue and you're unsure, the first thing to do is actually make sure you are. And there's a couple ways to do that. So here are some links and I'll just go over what each one of them is. Uh, Clio is the Community Legal Education Ontario uh, organization. Um, and they have a housing law guide for Ontario. So that's linked right there. And that's a, a lot of the content you'll find in there is similar to what's in this workshop, but it goes into much more detail uh, on certain things. It goes into... Um, more rights about different things. So we haven't even talked about the fact that tenants are entitled to have pets in their buildings, for example, just because we are limited on time and we're trying to focus on the, uh, I don't wanna say more important things necessarily, but perhaps the higher priority things. So that's a very good resource I would recommend people check out. The Ontario Tenant Rights Group is on Facebook. And if you have an issue, you can go there, explain your situation. I have personally used this before when I was um, in a situation where I found out my landlord had not paid a utility bill in over a year and they were threatening to cut off power for me. Um, so you can actually just go to this group and explain your situation and people will give you advice and give you links and resources as to what you might want to do next. I mentioned the FMTA, Federation of Metro Tenants Association. And so that organization does a lot of good work. Their website is linked below. And the reason I'm sharing that is because aside from the documentation and resources they have on their website, 
they also have a tenant hotline. So you can call them if you think you have an issue. Uh, they might not be able to help, but they, in terms of like telling you exactly what your issue is, but a lot of the time they can direct you to the right resources or organizations that can help you. And just a general piece of advice in situations, if you are ever having an issue or think you might be having an issue, um, one thing you should try and do as much as possible is record all your correspondence with your landlord. Um, sometimes, basically what I'm trying to say is have everything in writing. Um, you, there's no legal obligation to answer a phone call from your landlord. Like you can do everything in text and email if that's more convenient for you. And it's very important to have records of this kind of stuff as much as possible. Um, we've alluded to legal clinics before. And what I will say is that the first thing to know about them is that their capacity is limited uh, for two reasons. One being that the government not too long ago actually I believe half of the funding for legal clinics in Ontario. And the other reason is COVID is really increasing the necessity of these organizations. With that being said, um, a lot of the time when you know people need legal advice or legal counsel, it can be very, very expensive. Um, and that's a big reason people avoid it and wind up just getting railroaded um, and not getting the compensation they're entitled to if they're evicted, for example, or getting legally evicted or any number of things that happen. But below here are some links because a lot of legal clinics will do free or, or heavily discounted help depending on your situation. So the first link will show you the closest legal clinic to you. And the second, it's actually like a search engine that you can type in an address it'll show you the close legal clinics and the second link is a list of actual specific legal clinics. Um, and this is not location-based, but it'll show you legal clinics that, for example, will help you if you're below a specific income threshold and they can offer a free legal counsel to you, for example. There's other legal clinics in there that are for single mothers. There are some that are in there for people that are above a certain, certain income and below another certain income. So a lot of middle-class people wind up not really having access to these. So there's a legal clinic for that. So really there's a lot of different legal clinics out there and you might find one that can, that can help you depending on your situation for very cheap and or free depending on the situation. So if you do ever need it, these are some good resources that might help you find them. Um, if you are in a situation where you need a physical repair made and your landlord is refusing to do it or just ignoring it, uh, what you can do is called property standards in Toronto. And so property standards is just, you just contact them by calling 311 or emailing 311 at toronto.ca and the contact information is just down here. Um, and there's a link here below that gives you more information as to when property standards can help and in what context. Um, excuse me. But something very important to know about how they actually work is that, again, they only do physical repairs. So if your landlord's refusing to fix an appliance, then property standards can come in, do an inspection. You'll have to invite them into your home um, and they can issue a work order based on what's happening. If, you're, you know, if your heat isn't high enough, if you have repairs that your landlord has been dragging their heels on or outright refusing to make, they can't unfortunately help with things like above guideline rent increases or harassment or evictions. They can only really issue work orders um, for things that can physically be fixed. Here are just some examples of what that might look like. Um, something important to note here is that, again, they, they do cover vital uh, services such as heat, gas, water, um, but they can also be called if you have pests that the landlord is refusing to clean. Um, and something I'd like to draw attention to is that you can call property standards for things that aren't just within your unit. Um, for example, if you're a disabled person and snow clearing isn't occurring, it might be very important for you to be able to access a grocery store or something you need outside or just to be able to live your life as a human being to have uh, snow cleared on the front porch. And if your landlord or property uh, manager isn't doing that, you can still call 311 uh, and they might be able to issue a work order for things like that. So even communal areas, um, if you live in an apartment building, are covered by property standards. Um, this is a really big part of the presentation because the landlord tenant board is a very it it's a it's kind of a big deal to put it to put it uh, simply um, 
there have been so many cases where the landlord tenant board just winds up being a big mess to go there to the point where it's easy for it's in some cases it's easier for tenants to not go to the landlord tenant board than it is to um, try and get justice from their landlord in some senses. So the point I'll make here is that, as I mentioned, the RTA really tries to manage the relationship between landlords and tenants. Um, and this is the court that makes the final decisions, if you will. So if you, if you do have, wind up having a dispute or issue with your landlord of some form, um, and then it's not getting resolved, like if there's an above ground line rent increase, if you're trying to be evicted, um, if work orders are being ignored and you do want to get it resolved, it will eventually almost certainly wind up going to the landlord tenant board. Um, again, this, this is really more of a court. So because of that, it can be kind of a huge ordeal for tenants. And I'll give one example is that in the case of an above guideline rent increase, um, if one person wants to fight that, they might need to file to go to the landlord tenant board. They might need to file a claim. Filing a claim with the landlord tenant board itself is $40 or so. Whereas a 1.2% rent increase, if you're making like, if you have $1,000 uh, a, a month in rent, really that's three months rent. And in a lot of cases, um, there, there were a lot of cases in our community specifically where people would be moving in in March, for example. And the landlord would try and raise everyone's rent in January. And so for the people that moved in in March, they needed to be given a year between their last rent increase. And in, in those cases, if their rent is being increased in January, that doesn't apply. So if you do the math, it winds up being $12 a month and extra that they're paying. So to fight this at the landlord tenant board would cost $36 whereas it would cost, or sorry, it would save them $36 and it would cost $40 to apply. So really there are a lot of cracks that people can fall through where the landlord tenant board can't even help you. The example I just gave actually is kind of an important example of why it's really important to organize in your building uh, because if everybody goes to the landlord tenant board, it costs everyone $40 and everyone can win their rent increase back. Whereas if you go individually, you, you, it's so much harder to do things like this. So, this is an extremely brief overview of the landlord tenant board's reach um, and, and really situations can be so different as to how they wind up there. Just as one example that I think is really interesting is that there were uh, tenants in Parkdale at their apartment building. They had been asking for repairs to be made to their apartment building for weeks, months even. And the landlord eventually decided that with a, only a few days notice, that the balconies were actually not going to be fixed. It was more cost effective to simply tear them all down. Like, so suddenly everyone in this apartment building didn't have a balcony anymore. What happened was that the tenants there organized a tenant association and they said, look, we've had a reduction in our services. We no longer have our balcony. Um, what can we do about this? We want a 10% rent decrease and the landlord ignored it. Eventually this case went to the landlord tenant board and all the tenants won a 10% rent decrease as well as back pay for the rent they had paid um, while their balconies had been destroyed. And the reason I bring this up isn't to say that this is something that's going to always happen. It's just to say there, there's so much, there's so many cases that will wind up going to the landlord tenant board if it does escalate. So it really is this big, big organization, this big institution. Um, it, it's hard to put into words, honestly. Uh, just because it is just such a big legal hurdle for so many tenants. Um, I've also heard from the FMTA, um, not to be too negative here, but um, it, not to be too reductive either, but people of the FMTA that have spoken at a tenant organizing workshop I attended really did describe it as the landlord board. Um, and the reason for this being is just that the landlords go there frequently. They have relationships with the adjudicators, the lawyers, if you, or the judges, if you will, that oversee these cases. And they're just more friendly with them. There's so many cases. It's, it's much more common for evictions to be the topic at a landlord tenant board than any of the things I've mentioned about above guideline rent increases. Overwhelmingly, it's the eviction overseeing board, less so than it is um, the get back pay for your balconies being torn down board, if you will. So really there, there's a lot of bias built into this. It's not a partisan, it's not a bipartisan organization. 
Um, and there's a lot of problems with that. But as it stands, if you do have an issue and it does escalate and you have a solid legal case and counsel, then this can be an avenue to, um, to see through what your rights are and get them won. There are some cases where you can, you know, call in politicians to help. It's not universal. Um, and it certainly depends on who your politician are, uh, politician is, pardon me. But uh, for the Oakwood Vaughn community, we're very lucky because we have uh, a city councilor and a member of provincial parliament that can be very helpful. Um, I'm not including the member of parliament for our ward, and I would recommend you not look them up either because housing generally does not fall onto uh, the, the federal government's jurisdiction. It usually just comes down to provincial or municipal matters. There are some exceptions. There have been cases of like federal uh, social housing, but generally you'd want to go to municipal or provincial. And the reason for that is because as mentioned, the landlord tenant board can, and property standards that matter, can really be slow and ineffective in some cases. If you have a good city councilor that is on the side of tenants, um, then you might be able to just call them up and explain your situation and they might be able to help um, or give you the information you need to go through that. Councillor Josh Matlow, for example, has attended uh, tenant organizing meetings, I know. Um, so he's generally pretty decent if you're in the OPCO community. Um, and Jill Andrew is the member of the NDP. She has hosted pro housing uh, work before. She has a tenants rights package on her website, I believe. Uh, so there, is some, there are some benefits contextually, but it, you need to know who your councillor and member of, parla member of provincial parliament is. And you need to understand who the limitations, but it, it might be helpful for you. Um, another thing that you can do to actually exercise your rights is, <laughs> well, we're gonna have a tenant association. We're gonna be talking about that a lot more. But as we mentioned, like if you're part of a tenant association, then the tenant association itself can advocate on your behalf. And for the entire organization, for the entire building, um, provide the legal help you need. And one of those things is getting repairs made, getting uh, fighting against illegal rent increases. The, the core idea of a tenant association really is that we're stronger when we organize together and there's power in numbers. And they're two very simple ideas, but there's just so much truth to them, especially as tenants. If a landlord knows that every tenant has, you know, if there's a tenant association they're building, that necessarily means every tenant should be informed of their rights if something illegal has happened. And therefore, just it makes it so much harder to get away with a lot of things. One other thing that tenant associations do in, in the case of very well organized ones, um, it's just something that's impossible to really un undertake individually uh, because you'll, you'll be evicted if you try this individually. But if it really comes down to it, if it really is well organized and it really is something necessary, uh, tenants can organize a rent strike, uh, which is kind of like the final nail in the coffin. I'm not necessarily recommending anyone do this because it can be there can be consequences, um, but I've shared an example here of a rent strike that happened um, in Parkdale where tenants managed to defeat an illegal rent increase by going on a rent strike. If, and again, I'm not recommending anyone do or don't do this, but if you do decide that a rent strike might be in your best interest and you can organize one in your building, just a, a point to make is that you should still be paying rent into a savings fund somewhere because if it does come to it, you, you know, and your landlord threatens to evict you for this and it applies to everyone, you can generally just use that money that you've put in savings, pay, do the back pay on rent um, and you, the eviction notice is therefore null if you can prove you've paid your rent. Um, so just as a way to keep everyone safe, that's something to bear in mind. I think this is my favorite part of the tenants association, uh, part of the workshop, pardon me. We're going to be talking about tenant associations, what that is, and then we're going to be hearing from people that have helped organize them in their respective buildings, in their respective homes, I should say. So a tenant association is... It, really, I, I liken it to a, a labor union, in a sense. Um, except instead of representing workers, it's composed of and representing tenants. So a tenant association, in that sense, really it is just an organization formed by tenants and to represent tenants. Um, right here is a very important quote, I think, and I'd really stress the link at the bottom. 
for anyone that's interested at all in tenants associations, if they, you know, if you want to organize one in your building, in your community, um, I would really strongly recommend looking at the FMTA's Tenant Association Toolkit, which is the link down here. It's a very comprehensive, very digestible document that really outlines a lot of cases that might happen, case studies, uh, examples of what has happened before. It's a very informative document. I'd strongly recommend it to everyone. An excerpt I really like here and that really puts into context what a tenant association is, uh, and I'll just summarize it, is that a tenant association is not legally required to be registered with any agency whatsoever. It is not an institution in the legal sense per se. There's no tax return it needs to file. There's nothing like that. It's very abstract in that sense uh, compared to, for example, a labor union compared to a business. Uh, but really all a tenant association needs to do to prove that it exists to a landlord is to exist. So tenants just need to come together and say, we want to represent ourselves collectively. All tenants have the right to form these associations. There's no requirement of a, con a constitution to have it registered or incorporated. Frankly, the fact that a tenant association exists and makes it a legal entity per the RTA, it doesn't need approval from the landlord. It just needs to exist. It just needs tenants to agree that it should exist and therefore it will. And on that note about what that actually looks like, we're going to hear from Bill Worrell, who is uh, actually the on the Ofco board of directors. He's the chair. Um, but more relevantly to this discussion, not that that isn't relevant, um, is that he organized a tenant association at his previous home at 640 Lauder, which is a kind of a big apartment building in our community. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can make Bill, allow Bill to do um, the screen sharing now if he wants to, or if he doesn't want to, we can just have a conversation with the rest of us here and, you know, feel free to ask any questions if anyone has. I think this is a really good time to chat with people that have that hands-on experience and really want to share it. So yeah, Bill, if you will, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so I lived at 640 Lauder Avenue, uh, which is right near the corner of Vaughn Road, and I think is actually near Jen's, not far from where Jen lives now. Um, so I lived there from 1982 until about 1990. And in 1987, um, we st I started organizing a tennis association. I mean, it, it kind of started because there were problems. Like I was having problems getting uh, things fixed in my apartment. And then I realized that um, other, some of my neighbors were having problems getting fixed. And um, so we, uh, we started, um, I started talking to my neighbors and I met another guy who's also very keen on uh, organizing the building. So we eventually, so the two of us eventually were able to organize a tennis association in the whole building. Um, we, we set up an executive. Um, so we had a secretary and a treasurer. Uh, we had, this is in the eighties, right? So um, so it was all paper. Um, so we had membership cards that we made ourselves and we actually had dues, like people paid $5 a year. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was kind of a way of saying, yes, I belong to this organization and I believe in it. Um, we used to have our meetings in the lobby of the building. It was a building of about 120 units. Um, and we are in the laundry room down in the, in the basement. Um, and in the end, uh, I'll tell you in a minute, sort of some of the issues we dealt with, but in the end, we had a, about a 75% or, you know, three quarters of the apartments signed and dues paying members of our tennis association. So, yeah. So as I said, like we were having problems getting repairs done in our, in our apartment, uh, with appliances, the, uh, the oven, the stove wasn't working. Uh, and then the fridge started uh, acting really weird. Uh, so anyway, so we started talking to people on our floors, me and, the, uh, and my partner, um, organizer, he lived on a different floor. So we did our floors and then we started uh, figuring out leaders in the building who could work with us. Uh, some of the other issues that became really obvious were pests. We had uh, cockroaches and mice. 
Um, and then we, we had uh, an issue at, with one of the supers uh, the, who was part supporting the landlord and harassing some of the tenants. Uh, and then we, we had uh, an issue of the front door being broken and the landlord not fixing it. Um, and, uh, and then we started having the garage door was broken and we had car break-ins. Um, and there were some evictions that were going on that were very questionable. We actually stopped a couple of evictions. So, so, um, so you know, we as time went on, we we started dealing with more and more issues. Um, just in terms of some of the lessons that we learned, uh, and you know, we did have quite a few successes. Um, some of the lessons that we learned, you know, in in our tenant association, were. Um, Meetings are great because people actually get to hear from other members sort of what's going on in the building and it really builds solidarity in the building. So having, you know, um, I think we would, I don't know if we have monthly meetings, but definitely frequent meetings. Um, and when you have a victory, make it a big celebration because that's what people need. They need hope. They need that they can also do what their neighbor just accomplished. Um, you start small and you work from there. Um, and uh, we did do some actions. Uh, we didn't have a rent strike, but we did. Uh, there was a problem with, um, with pests uh, not being dealt with in the building. And so we started uh, with the, actually with the superintendent's support, we started not um, putting garbage. Uh, we had chutes back in those days. I don't think they have garbage chutes now in buildings, but but we would take them and put them in the parking lot. And so the super had to go out and he would complain to the landlord. Um, we, uh, we end up at, it's really important to develop relationships as David was talking earlier, uh, not only with your political representatives, but with the uh, property standards. I mean, once you get known, you're, you, you get known, then they, they, they assign somebody to your building. Uh, once they know that you're going to have a series of uh, complaints. And again, uh, just to repeat something David said, it was really important to train people to write stuff down. So even if you had a chat with the landlord, uh, with the uh, super, um, you needed to write it down and, and give a copy to the super saying, this is what we talked about. Um, and for some people, you know, it's uh, maybe not their first uh, response to write things down, but it's really important to help people do that. Um, I mean, some of the more unusual, <laughs> uh, and, and then there's the whole issue of relationship with, the, with your superintendent. Like some superintendents can be your best friend and others see themselves as representatives of landlords. So you really, it's, it can go either way. And then in our building, we had a very unusual situation where we discovered that uh, our superintendent had a supply of guns in his apartment, and he had a, a drunken argument with a, with a friend uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday night, um, late at night, and they, there was a bit of um, gun sh gunfire going on. So anyway, but um, so, you know, I, and just, I just, a final note is that when you live in an apartment building, quite often you really don't know your neighbors. You see them in the elevator. You don't really talk to them. But when you have a tenant association, all of a sudden, everybody knew each other. And it really built one of the things I didn't really think about ahead of time. It really built a community in the building. And people got to know each other. And there was a lot of community support going on that wasn't so much about tenants and landlords. It was about people helping each other and keeping an eye out for each other. So that was really uh, great, actually. It was really great for the building. So that's my story. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. So what, what happened with all the guns? Uh, well, the, the, the super was fired <laughs> and um, the way we found, like some people heard the gunshots, it was very, it was actually early in the morning, it was like 4 a.m. or something. And the way most of us found out about what had happened was that uh, 
I got up in the morning and I looked out every morning. I would look out my window because I was on the seventh floor and I saw this guy hovering in the alleyway and I realized he was a cop with a, a rifle. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? Anyway, he got fired. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, and, and actually now that you mention it, uh, I don't know if we actually took on the landlord on that issue. I mean, he wasn't obviously paying attention to who he was hiring, so. Yeah, I'll, I have one question for you, Bill, or a couple if, if no one else does, but um, my question to you would be, what did it really look like in the nitty gritty in terms of organizing? Were you going door to door and canvassing? Were you kind of like leafleting? Um, and, and if so, what kind of did that look like? What, what what kind of responses did you get for people? And do you have any tips for people that might want to, you know, want, here that might want to do that? Yeah, yeah. So we did do door to door. And um, I would, you know, just my recollection is that uh, the co-chairs, me and, and Pablo, were, uh, we did most of the door to door just to get things going. And also, you know, as chairs, as co-chairs, we really wanted to um, uh, get to know everybody in the in the building. It's good, you know, to know who's 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 who. So, knocking on the doors, uh, some people didn't want to answer. A lot of people did, and you know, I'm trying to think back. It was a few years ago, <laughs> um, but I think it was basically we started. Uh, campaigning on on the first big issue, which was our we had we had two or three issues that we wanted to ask people about. So, are you getting repairs done? Are you do you have problems with uh, cockroaches in your apartment? Um, uh, yeah. So you know those are all quite often the big ones, and um, and then we would tell them that we would have a meeting, and the meetings were in the lobby if the if the super was friendly. Um, so, and the apartment building had one of those standard lobbies, you know, with quite an open space. So we would have like 20, 25 people there and, um, um, and we would talk about the issues, but yeah, you start by going door to door and getting and introducing yourself and talking about, you know, what the, um, what, uh, what the tenant association aims to accomplish. I mean, and it was interesting in the meetings too, because, Sometimes you had to kind of educate, uh, you know, show people what a tennis association is. Like our building was very multicultural. Um, and sometimes people would say things, they would put up their hand and say, yeah, my neighbor, he cooks food with all these spices and it comes into my apartment and I don't like the smell. And I, and I would say, you know, that's not really a tennis association issue. Um, you know, our job is to deal with land, how the landlord treats us as tenants, right? And over time, people developed more solidarity, you know. Um, uh, yeah, so going door to door was really important. And sometimes um, uh, you could get a neighbor to talk to their neighbor, you know, if, if somebody didn't answer the door, you might talk to a couple of neighbors and say, hey, do you know this person? Do you want to talk to them? Yeah. We had a petition once too, and that's also a handy thing because uh, I forget, I think the petition was about when the um, garage door was broken and there were break-ins in our car, in, in people's cars. And um, so we actually got a petition uh, to confront the landlord on, on, um, on getting that rep uh, door rep uh, repaired. So, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, no? All right, well, I have one final question that if no one else does, I'm just curious what you, what, how was your relationship with your landlord in terms of like, you individually, if you ever had any uh, requests for them to make repairs or even just management before and after the tenant association? Like, was there a change? And if so, what did it kind of look like? You're talking about me personally or in general in the building? 
Uh, both. I mean, if you had yeah. like repairs to make and you asked specifically yeah. what was the response mm. versus after the tenant association was established and and thriving, I guess it sounds like in your case. So um, things change really, like you know, within. Uh, this has already happened. Like this happened with my tenant association, and also with one, another one that I helped start, is that the landlord's first reaction is to actually come to the and meet with the executive of the tenant association because um, they think that maybe that might be intimidating or they want to find out what's going on. Um, but in reality, what once you started winning victories, all of a sudden things started happening because they knew that we knew what we were talking about and our rights, you know, we knew how to defend our rights. And quite frankly, some of these big landlords, especially, they don't want to, you know, it's, it's, it, they, they don't want to have to deal with stuff all the time, um, especially if they own several buildings and all this stuff. So I would say that the tenant association within a year, we were getting pretty much everything that we fought for, you know, like repairs, cockroaches. I'm not saying it'll be like that in every building. And this was in the eighties, early nineties, times are different now. So who knows? I mean, our landlord was a corporation somewhere in St. Catharines. Um, but some buildings are owned by, you know, finance companies that don't even have their headquarters in Canada. So, so, um, uh, but that was my experience. And personally, just so you know, <laughs> If you're the leader, some people are scared of being a leader of a tenant association because they're afraid they'll be targeted. But my experience, and I've heard this from other people, is that once they realize that you know what you're doing, you actually get service better than anybody else in the building because they don't want to, if they're not going to harass you, they're going to they're gonna give you quick service in the faint hope that maybe you'll stop organizing a tenant association or... Um, or whatever. So, so, and also that, you know, you're right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, cause I know some people are, are scared of being publicly seen as the leader of the association, but it's actually more than likely in your favor. And when I worked in the union movement, it was the same thing, you know, like when I was a, a shop steward or on the executive, um, I usually got what I wanted because the company knew who they were dealing with. Right. So anyway, Cool. Thank you so much for sharing, Bill. Does anyone have any any last questions? Or all right, I think that's all for Bill. Um, well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. Um, one thing I will say, I'll just go back to screen share here for one second. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill. It's always great to hear from someone that has that experience and is so willing to share it and just talk in depth about it. Um, and I'm just reminded of your story. You're talking about how much easier it is to get these things you're entitled to once you have that tenant association. And really, it is just united we bargain and divided we beg. So I'm really happy to hear these, these firsthand stories. And I think it's really important to share. Um, and yeah, next up is our last speaker, last part of the presentation. I'm very excited to have Flynn here. Uh, Flynn Daunt, as we've alluded to earlier, has successfully organized uh, tenant associations, uh, pardon me, a tenant association at 2419 Keel Street, um, and has so far successfully resisted two separate attempts at rent eviction, and I really hope those are the only two. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to take, I'm going to uh, stop screen sharing for one second, hand this over to Flynn, if you'd like to screen share or just talk, it's up to you. Thanks so much for coming out. Hi, yes, uh, one second. Um... Hi, um, so can anyone, can everyone see this? Everyone, yep, okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, um, my name's Flynn Daunt. Uh, I um, 
I, I'm not, I don't know how to describe myself. I'm not like the chief organizer or um, uh, uh, head of any kind of like solidified tenant organization. Uh, just simply a representative uh, from the community from 2419 Keel Street. Um, I know that shit says the wrong thing there, but whatever. Uh, 2419 Keel Street is a low income, low rise apartment, 12 units comprised of, fa uh, of families, multi generational, highly diverse, with many languages spoken, and many have been re residences for, um, for decades. Um, so back in uh, February of 2021, um, our uh, small building was bought for um, was was bought kind of without really anyone notice noting uh, what happened. Uh, the only thing we understood was that our building had been sold, and the new owners wanted us out in about three months. Um, most people had kind of no idea. Um, what was happening again a lot of the people in the building we have about like diff five different languages if not more spoken in this place it's, again only 12 units um so it's a it's a very um tight uh community uh, it's a very condensed community but no one had really been through any of this before so we were all pretty um uh scared of what was going to happen if and this was february of 2021 in the middle of the height of uh, the pandemic, uh, you can imagine the anxiety and fear of, of a lot of these people. Um, there are seniors in it. There are, are um, new families. There are babies less than a year old. Um, a lot of people have been suffering from job loss or job reduction. Um, so uh, all we knew is that our, our um, building was kind of bought by some company called Preventus Property Management, which after looking into it is a company that got made that year, or sorry, that week, like a week before we got bought, when I looked up who these people were, there was no information about it. There was no understanding uh, what was what was, like what was happening. Um, when we looked into the actual name of the company that owned us, it was simply something called 2419 Keel Street Inc. Um, again, a company that was made uh, not a week before um, the uh, we were we knew that the company uh, that the building had been sold, um, and uh, uh, so basically what happened was that two gentlemen came to our apartments and tried to meet us all one on one. They represented themselves as simply someone named Kim and someone named Brandon. Uh, Their um, Business cards literally said Kim and Brandon and almost no more information, not their last names, nothing. So clearly they wanted us to not know who they were or what's going on. Um, and their promise was that they would uh, temporarily uh, have us evicted. And then when uh, their big renovation of our building would be done, we would be allowed back in. That didn't seem like it was a real um, offer and uh, none of that seemed to make any sense to us. So we were all still pretty scared. Uh, Brendan was a, a, a taller gentleman who wanted to come off as a, a good guy. But when you looked into it, it turned out that he owned a company called Riley Real Estate Ventures. His name was Brendan Riley. And um, essentially um, what his whole thing was is that he bought all low income buildings like ourselves, kicked out all the tenants, did a small amount of renovations and then jacked up the price. So the first thing we did was um, we organized, uh, our superintendent had um, the contacts for everyone in the building. So she was really, really, really instrumental in uh, connecting all of us. Um, for those that we couldn't connect to, uh, I simply knocked on their door and tried to talk to them about the situation and they seemed very, very scared. Unfortunately, I didn't get to a few of them quick enough and some of them had signed documents, they didn't know what it was. Um, but uh, we organized and the very first thing we did was all together um, uh, write a letter 
to uh, Brendan Riley and to the uh, landlords, who, uh, basically saying we refuse to leave. And w the other thing is, we will talk to them as a group, not as individuals, because we learned that if they talk to us as individuals, they can play us against each other. Mm -hmm. They can make promises. They can um, uh, they can say one thing to one tenant and one thing to another, and we wouldn't have any connection or understanding of what's happening. And that if we wanted to bargain, we were much stronger bargaining as a, a, a one voice than as individuals. We don't have a lot of power as individuals, but a group of 12 families who um, have solidarity with each other uh, have a much greater um, uh, voice than, uh, than us as individuals. And when we actually talked to Brendan face to face, uh, he literally backed into a corner and got very, very agitated. Um, and one of the thing he would not uh, stop he, the thing he would he would absolutely not agree to was talking to us as a group. So clearly that was the thing that um, pushed him uh, and put him on on the back foot. So that's incredibly important. Do not take on anyone by yourselves. Um, you could try, and I, I give you my best, and you need a community behind you. But um, if you all speak in was one voice, it's great. Uh, so unlike uh, Bill, who you know had to go door to door and have daily meetings. One thing I found that was really, really, really useful, and I would recommend to anyone organizing an association or, or just organizing with temps, is getting a um, WhatsApp group, which is an app you can download, and essentially everyone in the uh, association or in the organization can read everything. So it's a great way for you to say, "I've got stuff broken in my apartment," or "This is th th I got contacted by this." Um, the other thing is record everything. Um, everyone has a phone now, so just turn on the recorder if you're having a conversation. We've recorded uh, um, telephone conversations and one-on-one -on -one conversations and all kinds of things. It's all come back to to really um, help us and explain to everyone else what's happening. Uh, of course, um, we I contacted a number of legal clinics and community services. The one that got back to me quickest was the Parkdale Community Legal Services. Cole is here with us and he's been completely instrumental in, in helping organize and um, uh, motivate us to continue fighting. So um, any other services that can help you with that is fantastic. They can help lead, um, lead you to uh, having a, a stronger plan and a stronger attack. Uh, so this is uh, Brendan Riley here. Um, like I said before, this is his whole, his whole thing. This is him smiling at us as we were protesting in front of his home. I'll give it, get back to it later. <laughs> but one thing that is key about his business sense and what his company does is that he does legitimately think that we are, uh, the, the tenants that are living in low income places need to be removed so that he can make money. This is my favorite quote from him, which says, uh, a better quality home for a better quality ten tenant, which is exactly what he, thinks of all of us is that we're you know low quality tenants and we need to be removed um so it is really kind of a, a different sense of of who should be living there uh the next thing we did uh the first kind of protest we did was organize kind of a facebook group to get attention to us and for media to be able to follow the story we um did sort of a online protest and uh left negative reviews about you know, uh, his professionalism, his company, um, you know, went on his Facebook, his Instagram, Twitter, all kinds of stuff, and got friends and family and a community to really tell him what we think of his business. And as long as we were all telling the truth, we really pushed that. Um, we caused him to kind of lock down all of his business's social media presence, which I think really, really um, let him know that we were serious about what we were doing that um, if he wanted to wait and get marshals to drag us out of our homes that he was also going to have consequences for doing something like that um, and the thing is is that we also didn't just wait to give him our message and hope that the landlord tenant board is on our side 
um, that was one thing that was very important was that the um, that we I think like you said if you look at who is uh, the judge of the landlord board it is all landlords it's all people who work in the real estate agent it, it, uh, um, uh, industry so you know if it comes to that of course go and fight but your best bet is to make it so that the landlord um, or whoever's bought your building and wants to rent evict you all, you know, it, it's it's going to hit them harder than they thought they were going to. If they thought that they were just going to give you a small amount of money and you were going to leave, or that the marshals were going to kick you out, you're gonna you're gonna hit them right back. You cannot just um, be passive on this. You really, really do have to go out and protest. So uh, we went and flyered his business and the community around his business. We passed out flyers outside of it, posted um, you know, the fact that he's evicting our families outside of his business all up and down the neighborhood, um, to which I understand really, really bothered him as it should. Um, and it bothers us even more that he was actively doing it and bothered the community more that, that he was doing stuff like this. Um, and so that was our real first show that we are not only going to uh, fight back, but we're going to fight back on the streets and we're going to fight back out on his home turf. Uh, because if he can make us feel unsafe in our homes, we can provide that back to him, back to his business and, and make that suffer as much as possible. The point again being that if he continues this, it's going to hurt him more than it helps him. Again, it, you can do all of this. This is all legal. Um, this is your right to protest. You have a right to do these things. Um, and as long as what you're saying and what you're doing is the truth, uh, you really do need to go out there and, and push as hard as you can. Um, organize with your neighbors. They, are, they also want to do this. Not everyone can, of course. People have work. People have disabilities. Not everyone can be there on the street. But make sure that everyone is supportive of those ideas and, and agrees to it. Um, this was our first real showing of solidarity and real showing that we could um, get out there and, and tell the community exactly what is happening to us. Um, there's supposed to be a video here that didn't load, but we did protest outside of, oh, there it is. I don't know if I have sound coming through uh, on this, but hopefully I do. Uh, but we the next thing we did after that was ignored um, was actually go to Brendan Riley's home and protest outside of his home. Again, he comes to our home he enters our home to make us feel unsafe, uh, to make us feel like uh, we're, um, you know, don't belong where we are. We're going to do the exact same thing. So we did the same thing we did to his business, which was flyer and protest and tell the community what's happening. But we did it to his actual home neighborhood um, because it, it, we believe that his neighbors deserve to know exactly what he's up to. And uh, I think the, the protest went really, really well. Um, hopefully it comes through. So this is one of uh, the uh, daughter of one of our tenants who is out there with us. We had children, we had elderly people, we had um, we had babies out there. Um, you know, basically all of our families are out there protesting in the streets, making sure people understand that um, it's incredibly important to get everyone out there. And and when you know what this amongst a lot of our protests were featured in the media. We have phenomenal footage of, um, you know, children protesting, of, of, of families protesting, no one that looked dangerous or, uh, or riled up or anything like that. So optically to the rest of the world, it really did look like what we wanted to show, which was um, a series of families suffering under someone's uh, short-term greed. This worked really, really well. Um, Brendan, after um, not knowing what to do for you know, 20, 30 minutes, eventually came out and, and realized the only way we were going to leave is if he told us the evictions were withdrawn. We got that on video, and then later we got a representative to come over and, and, 
and put in writing that the evictions were withdrawn. And we had won. It was really, really incredible. We had pushed this guy to his limits and really gave him no other solution that if he wanted this to stop, he had to, to, to let us live our lives in our home uh, with the rent that we're paying in the home that we've been living in for five, 10, 20 years. Uh, and, you know, after that, they, they kind of laid off a little bit. Um, you know, uh, and unfortunately, um, after a few months, uh, Brendan really tried to sell the building and tried to contact us as, as individuals again, even though that's what we, our first complaint was that you don't do that. We ignored that. Everyone was on board. We had already, we were already organized. We were already talking to each other all the time. We were already planning. Um, and after that, he sent and teens to only a few of us this time, hoping once again to break that solidarity. And luckily, we had already a plan of attack. We had already that solidarity. So even though I personally wasn't getting an N13 eviction notice, I knew that that one was coming. And I knew that my neighbors were just as vulnerable as I am. And I'm not gonna, we were not gonna stand for our neighbors in our community being attacked, even if it was one person. Uh, so, we started it up again. Uh, we posted on our Facebook that this was happening again. The media got that attention. That was a really good story of, of it happening again. Uh, we went to his home again. Uh, he almost ran one of us over with his car. He was so upset, which is obviously not good, but we got that on video. Um, and we kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And we went to another one of his family's business and protested in front of that. Um, and, and I believe got that uh, really um, put that business in jeopardy because uh, that business was a, I bl believe a, the idea was like, it was a community helping business of some sort that was its advertising. And people were pretty upset that the business that was supposed to help the community is being funded by a business that hurts the community. Um, and just, just went out there and like I said, just, just hit them hard. And some people had low morale and we just made sure that we went door to door, made sure that people were still on board with this, still wanted to fight it. And people came out and really, really did fight again. We found the home of one of the investors to, um, uh, Brendan Riley's project and went there and, and flyered that home and let people know about who that investor was and what they're investing in and all kinds of stuff. And we really apparently pushed harder and harder and harder to where I believe the business that owns us is kind of dissolved in some way and someone else owns it that we're not too sure who that is, but you know maybe that'll be another fight. Hopefully it won't. But we really, really got this uh, individual um, and this business off of our backs from what I believe has been something that it was, has been um, really, really trying to harm us and trying to attack us. In terms of individual harassment, um, there hasn't been too much of a blowback. I think we've hit them harder than they've hit us. I personally seem to be on the receiving end of legal notices and um, all kinds of, of things that haven't really harmed me, but definitely have been a, a form of harassment against me personally. I'm not, like I said, not the leader of it, but I have, um, I'm a natural English speaker. I was born in Canada. Um, I'm one of the only white people in the building. Uh, not saying that that's anything better or worse, but uh, I believe that I, like I can communicate on a level that some people who were, were weren't born in the country can communicate on. So I've been talking to a lot of press and stuff like that. Um, and so I've been targeted because he thinks that I'm the leader of this thing, um, which I'm, I'm not. Um, but uh, so my, my experience, unlike Bill, getting my stuff done easier hasn't really been uh, my experience. But uh, other than that, it's it's uh, it's it hasn't really harmed me in any real way either, other than kind of an annoyance. Uh, and like I said, like the thing I would really really take away of this is 
build that community with your neighbors. I didn't really know my neighbors that much. I'd been living there for about a decade. Didn't really know them that much until something like this happened. And then we were all on board and we realized we all had this common goal of making sure that none of us were kicked out onto the street uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, and we had a number of things. I didn't mention it, but you know, we did have uh, a politician help us out. Mm -hmm. We did have a lot of media coverage. Um, none of those things, though, are one thing. You can't just do mm. one of these things. You have to do all of them. So it all helps. Um, you know, the social media uh, aspect of it, the protests, the solidarity, all of that was very, very integral to making sure that we came out on top of this. I really do hope this is over. I don't know if it is, but I do know that if anything were to happen again, we're together and we have a game plan. And I, I really believe that um, anything they throw at us, we can throw at them 10 times. Uh, we, we, you know, and it really gives us a sense of strength that I don't think we ever had before. Um, like I said, get to know your neighbors. That WhatsApp has been a fantastic thing. We talk on it all the time. We share anything that happens. If anyone, if any of them try to contact us, we share the entire email with everyone. If anyone tries to call us, we've recorded and shared the entire conversation with everyone. Everyone is on the same page. Um, and, uh, you know, don't leave. That's what I tell everyone who who's goes like, I'm going through a similar thing, what should I do? Well, number one, don't leave. Don't sign anything. Don't really acknowledge that you have to do anything. Um, you know, don't, don't agree to the situation that they've given you, which is you have three months to leave because I want to put us I want to put paint on the walls and I want to jack up the price by a thousand dollars. Um, and don't leave it up to the LTB. Um, sometimes it will get there. Uh, you know, people are stubborn, but if you can beat it before it gets there, uh, you know, you, you really don't want to just, just say no and let, let the course of history happen. You have to get out there. You have to make them feel uncomfortable. You have to let them know that you're, um, a force of families and tenants and working people who will make it difficult for them to do this. Um, I, I would hope anyone who comes to your home and says you have to leave, you would, you know, you would fight them and not just in a legal battle, but you would let people know what's happening. Um, the uh, um, organizations and legal, legal clinics can really put, um, set you on the right course and push you in the right direction but you're going to do um, all of the kind of uh, heavy lifting and your morale is going to take a hit sometimes and you're going to get worried. And it's definitely an anxiety that no one wants to deal with. But if you stick with your, ten your, your neighbors and you communicate and you organize and you have meetings, uh, I do believe that you follow that and you'll end up on top. Uh, if anyone needs to contact me for any kind of practical reason or anything, um, here's my number. Yeah, Bill. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a legal professional of any kind. I'm just someone who's been through this before. Um, so if you just want to contact me and, and let me know that you're going through something similar, um, how to talk to my neighbors, what's the first thing I should do? I want to start a, you know, I want to start that first social media push. I want to hit them online, talk to me. I got a, a bunch of, like, luckily a lot of my, I have a kind of a, a, a larger social media or online presence. So I was able to kind of get a lot of people on board and, and, and push, push that. And I think hit them unexpectedly hard. Uh, their uh, Google rating, I think was something they really cared about. And it went from a five to a 3.5, which, um, I think would really upset them, uh, stuff like that. Like having to lock down that stuff was, I think, really upsetting for them and having to, you know, know that they were not uh, um, gonna hear any, if they went home, they didn't have to deal with us where they could harass us at our home, but they didn't have to feel anything at their home. I think that really put them on edge. So you just gotta make it so we're really not worth their while to deal with, I think. And if there's any questions about, again, my expertise is just practically what what do you do and how do you how do you hit back? Um, 
I'm not the best legal scholar, um, but if you want to know, you know, how to find out who owns your who owns the business or um, the best time of day to protest in, in front of someone's home, stuff like that, I, I can help out with that. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was fantastic. And I, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I, I read a few different articles about your experience, but having the whole story really painted out for us was, I found it very informative. And I think there's going to be a lot of good takeaways from this um, that we can share on the Ofco social media later. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know Flynn already asked this, but Sorry if I uh, if I if if you want me to clarify anything, I'm not the best uh, public speaker, so I know I tend to kind of rush through things. I th I thought you did a fantastic job personally. Cool. I think um, if I may, I'll reclaim host for a second. I'll just say a few more things. Um, the first of which is if everyone could. Um, and, and actually, the first thing I'll do, I'll just do a quick screen share because this is, um, if everyone can see this right now, these are development, every blue dot is a development application in our building. And I think it's really in a, in a sorry, a development application in our community that is going to displace tenants. Um, so unfortunately, this is going to happen here. And I think it's really important to share that. So again, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'll go back to this and share this now. And hopefully everyone can see the presentation again. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just share, share this again. If anyone would like to get in touch with us, um, please do that here. Um, this is, you know, this is if, if you found like there was something important in this workshop that you'd like to stay in get in touch with us for, if you want help, um, this is how you can do that. So thank you so much. Um, one thing I will also say is I've shared this survey in the chat. Um, there's an alternative link here. Um, and if you could really, if you could fill this out, that would be, that would mean so much. It really helps us in our work and it gives us a way to go forward. Um, and yeah, it, it just would be extremely helpful to inform our work and get some information about what we're doing here. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone so much. Um, just a special thanks to people that have helped out. Dana Bronsitter is a volunteer. She did graphic design for a lot of the promotional material and has volunteered her time in other way. Tana Printing helped us out by doing some translations. Um, and Alex and Aisha both helped with leafleting and postering for this event. So thanks everyone so much. Um, yeah, again, if you could fill up the survey, that would be so helpful, but thanks, Bill, for your talk. Thanks, Flynn, for your talk, and thanks, everyone else, for coming out. I think that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks.